Hi guys, welcome back. I shall now be discussing regarding malabsorption syndrome. Most of the topics in GI tract have a overlap with either pathology or with surgery, but this is a pure internal medicine topic. So I would like you to listen to this topic with lots of care and this will help you improve your strike rate in this topic. I want to first emphasize that because there's going to be damage to the mucosa of the gut, therefore the osmotic load is not going to be absorbed. Therefore, most of the cases of malabsorption syndrome will be having osmotic diarrhea. In fact, lots of time in the exam, they use terms like diarrhea responsive to fasting or diarrhea non-responsive to fasting. So let me first explain that to you. You see, when it comes to secretory diarrhea, which is commonly seen with pancreatic tumors like uh, gastrinoma or a insulinoma or a glucagonoma, you would be having opening of water channels. So even if a person will stop eating, still the water channels would be opening under the impact of various hormones. As a result of it, secretory diarrhea is always going to be non-responsive to fasting. But the topic that I'm going to explain to you, malabsorption syndrome, here it's mainly going to be an osmotic load related to sugar and fat mainly the sugar component so this sugar is going to be unabsorbed it will draw in water and therefore we will be having a osmotic diarrhea that would be responsive to fasting because if person stops eating or takes minimal amount of food and especially if you avoid the carbohydrate component because there would be no osmotic load no drawing of water and therefore the diarrhea of this person will disappear so i want you to be very clear about these two terminologies that i've just highlighted repeating them once again secretory diarrhea is a terminology that will be very commonly read by you with respect to pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors on the other hand, the current topic that we are studying will be having mucosal damage to the small intestine primarily as a result of which because the osmotic load is not going to be absorbed, it's going to draw in water and therefore our patients will mainly be having osmotic diarrhea and therefore he will say diarrhea, I'm writing alphabet R which means responsive to fasting and I repeat my statement when it comes to secreted diarrhea, he's usually going to use the term diarrhea non-responsive to fasting. Next, I'm going to talk about some more basics. You are familiar with the fact that duodenum is the primary site for absorption of iron. So because this area can be damaged in malabsorption syndrome, like in celiac sprue, you mostly will be having damage to the duodenum and the jejunum and duodenum being the primary one affected. Therefore, the absorption of iron will be hampered and uh, therefore serum ferritin levels will be also reduced in the patient. Similarly, you are familiar with the fact that folic acid absorption occurs both from duodenum and jejunum. But if you ask me to give a single best response, it would be folic acid deficiency that is occurring due to jejunal damage. As a result of it, we will have to do some tests also that would help you identify there is a folic acid deficiency. Similarly, ileum, especially the terminal ileum is the site for absorption of vitamin B12. So if there is a disease of the ileum, like I will speak about bacterial overgrowth syndrome. I'll explain what I mean by the word bacterial overgrowth syndrome as we progress in the discussion. But at the moment, I want you to understand that because ileum is the primary site involved in bacterial overgrowth syndrome, B12 levels in the body will fall and we will have to do workup for the patient. What I mean by workup is that for uh, vitamin B12 deficiency, the traditional test that we read is Schilling's test. However, in reality, lots of times Schilling's test may not be available at your hospital. No, If you're talking about a tertiary care hospital, uh, some... Uh, uh, um, hospital like Ames or PJ Chandigarh that's where we can you know still anticipate Schilling's test to be available though even in tertiary care hospitals more uh, mostly in the world this test is not available because of the concerns related to the radioactive tracer related to this particular test so for academic reasons Schilling's test is going to look very great but in reality it's hardly done so in clinical practice, what am I doing? I'm doing a serum vitamin B12 level in the patient, which will be lesser in a patient of bacterial overgrowth syndrome because ileum is the one that is affected. Lots of time to test your biochemistry component. He may not write the serum vitamin B12 because it's very, very obvious. So he is going to write tests like serum homocysteine levels or he's going to write terms like MMA, that is methyl malonic acid levels, which are elevated. So do remember the surrogate methods that the examiner will deploy to ask you regarding damage to the ileum. I said three things, B12 levels are lesser in the serum, homocysteine is elevated, MMA values are elevated. It tells you that the ileum is the one that is worst affected. When it comes to folic acid deficiency, the standard test that we do is RBC folate levels. But again, the point is because he will write the word RBC folate, it's going to be a piece of cake for you. So to test your biochemistry, he can write this test, no, figlu, that is going to be for amino. It's I would stand for amino glutamic acid test. And along with that, as I said, it can also be written as RBC folate. 
though uh, I mean it's unlikely to give straightforward things so that's why you know you should be knowing about these unconventional terminologies also and for iron uh, being malabsorbed you would be having serum ferritin of the patient being significantly and substantially reduced. Now once we get this data right I also want to highlight because they can be fat malabsorption they would be steatoria in a patient so fat soluble vitamin levels will also be reducing that is vitamin A, D, E and K. So there is a distinct possibility that he can talk about purpuras or he can talk about bone pains because of the osteomalacia component that would come up in the patient. Now since the primary complaint of these patients is osmotic diarrhea, it's my job to next explain to you that how would I identify carbohydrate malabsorption, what are the investigations that would help you to be sure about the diagnosis. We'll talk about the ideal test, we'll talk about the screening tests which are available and uh, you see some of these tests would be invasive, some would be non-invasive and we first prefer non-invasive tests. The non-invasive test that you are going to read in multiple choice questions is called as D-xylose absorption test. You are aware xylose is going to be a pentose sugar. It's not going to be absorbed from the gut mucosa. If the mucosal damage is present, this mucosal damage could be due to antibodies. This mucosal damage could be due to organisms like E. coli or GRDF for that matter of fact. But once there is a mucosal damage, then this simple pentose sugar is not going to be absorbed. So this is initially a screening test. The problem is that if you are going to call up any good laboratory in your city and ask them to get a d absorption test done for your patients, they'll just say that sir we do not do this test. So let's look at what are the alternatives available before you so that you can make the diagnosis of your patient. A additional test that I can mention here and is uh, I think very frequently used is breath hydrogen test. Like you guys are familiar that breath urea test can be useful for diagnosis of H. pylori including eradication of H. pylori can be determined by breath urea test. Here I want to highlight breath hydrogen test helps you to determine carbohydrate malabsorption. The ideal test that should be done is a small intestinal mucosal biopsy but as I highlighted invasive tests are something that uh, patients and parents, I'm talking about parents because celiac is going to be a pediatric profile. So if you talk to a mother and tell her that you see I suspect that your child has malabsorption I want to do a biopsy of the small gut she may not be so receptive to this suggestion in the initial consultations. Obviously as you will gain the trust of this mother she will be more comfortable and she would definitely like you to explain what is the workup that you are going to do in case of a celiac sporu. So yes the best test is small intestinal mucosal biopsy but because of the invasiveness component I have not written it first I said I can start with non-invasive tests initially. Another test that you will read sometimes written in multiple choice questions again in pediatrics is tool for reducing substances. Meaning the word reducing substances would be sugar in the stool. You see I am saying a surprising thing because normally you read about sugar in the urine no. You read about sugar in the urine in diabetes well it does not teaching you sugar in the stool. That is stool for reducing substances positive basically means there is sugar present which is contributing to the osmotic diarrhea component. They have used another test where they have used xylose with radioactive carbon that is 14C. So you might read tests like 14C D xylose breath test. So there are two breath tests that I have actually explained to you. One is going to be linked to radioactive carbon, second is breath hydrogen test and anyway radioactivity is something that you know people are not very very comfortable with sometimes. So when you are going to talk about this a radioactive isotope I mean educated people might again be having relatively less acceptance. So I have in this particular discussion in these five points tried to highlight two things. If the question simply says what is the screening test to be done then the conventional answer that is given in most of the books is D-xylose absorption. If they say what is the best test, what is the investigation choice to diagnose mucosal disease, it's going to be a small intestinal mucosal biopsy. We also have tests in between with fair amount of accuracy that can help you in diagnosis of this condition. Lots of people of carbohydrate malabsorption will have bloating. They will have borboy gummy that is noise coming from the tummy. You see even when you and me have a meal, then if you lying in a quiet room, especially after a heavy meal, you might be hearing some sounds coming from your abdomen. That's your peristaltic waves that are contributing to gut movement that is contributing to the sound. But in these patients that will definitely be exaggerated. I will next explain to you regarding how would you work up a person having fat malabsorption. Well, these patients will be having manifestation called as stratoria or instead of saying stratoria, he will use the word greasy, bulky, foul smelling stools. 
the stool will be difficult to flush away. I mean, the person will say, like, he goes to the washroom, he has to press on the flush button twice, thrice, then the fecal matter is washed away. I hope you recall, I explained to you that in Malena, there's going to be a black tarry stool that's going to stick to the toilet seat. So again, the person will say that the stool, ha I mean, he has to press on the button, the flush button multiple times to flush off the stool. So I'm talking about two stools which are difficult to flush away. And the person will talk about this when he's describing his bubble habits there. So fat malabsorption is the standard presentation of statoria. And along with this, even deficiency of vitamin A, D, E, K can be associated. Now, one of the tests which is available for this condition is a 24-hour fecal fat estimation. But you can understand that uh, for this, you have to collect the stool of the person for 24 hours. No? So first, uh, imagine the plight of the patient. I mean, he's saying, sir, uh, you mean that I need to collect my stool in a box? He's considering it very unhygienic. And he says, sir, uh, I'm not very comfortable with this. So the acceptability part may be limited here. And even if you convince somebody, now imagine this packet containing stool has reached the laboratory. Imagine the uh, facial expression of the laboratory technician when you ask him to open the pack and do this estimation of 24 hour fecal fat estimation. I mean, this guy is saying, sir, I want to realize, I mean, you are making me do such a smelly and unhygienic test. So we need to use technology to our advantage. Well, what is the technology that we can use here is a breath test. I can put up as a question to you here. Can you tell me a breath test for fat malabsorption? Well, you should be aware of this that we have a test available at uh, the name of breath trioline test. This is going to help you in identifying fat malabsorption. So most of the time, there is a distinct possibility that when you read up these questions of malabsorption syndrome, he's going to talk about various investigations also like ferritin versus fig glue test versus let me say methyl malonic acid levels so when you look at those tests it would tell you which part of the gut is involved and along with this obviously the tests that are written on the board here like breath triolene breath hydrogen test these are obviously important ones from the exam domain in a sense that they can help you and identify this and you get a fair amount of idea about what substance is being malabsorbed in this case now, before I describe the first disorder that is celiac sprue related to malabsorption syndrome topic, I would just like to show you an image in which you can see this blue bag and you can see the mouth of the patient who's blowing into this bag. The test that is being done in this case would be called as breath hydrogen test and as I've sensitized you, this would be helpful in identification of carbohydrate malabsorption. When it comes to celiac sprue as a topic, you will get this topic uh, questions both in medicine as well as in pediatrics. Well, this is due to the antibodies which are causing damage to the microvilli. So the brush border epithelium of the gut is damaged. If the surface area responsible for absorption is lesser, sugar won't be absorbed. And that explains the osmotic diarrhea component. Well, uh, lots of time you will read terms like gluten sensitive enteropathy or simply the word gluten enteropathy. Sometimes he might write the word gliadin sensitive enteropathy. So these are surrogate and alternative terms which are used in the exam. When I look at the basic information, you see you are familiar that in all babies we should be going in for exclusive breastfeeding. That is before six months of age. So the clinical presentation of this disease will begin after six months. That is when you start introducing complementary feeds in the child. At this junction, I also want to highlight that lots of time, uh, especially in a hot Indian summer, a mother might be giving water or might be giving honey or might be giving nutritional supplements to the baby even before six months of age. I'm just mentioning an accessory extra point here from my perspective that they mentioned that a mother is giving vitamin supplements and honey to a three month old child. Well, it's obviously not recommended because, you know, honey can contribute to botulinism and water is anyway not required. Supplements are not required. Breast milk is more than adequate for a baby less than six months of age. He said, what is the practice of giving water to a baby before six months of age called as? We call it prelactyl feeds and prelactyl feeds are contraindicated. In fact, you can relate to this better if I say that suppose it's a construction worker mother. And she's working in this NREGA scheme where they have to dig up roads and tunnels, etc. So in a hot Indian summer, this mother is working at 45 degrees Celsius temperature. And this little baby who's three months of age is under the shade of the tree. I can give an example of a construction worker mother. She's working in a hot Indian summer of 45 degrees Celsius. The baby is under the shade of a tree and she's asking you, doctor, can I give water to the baby? I told her no, but this mother, she purchased a bottle of bisleri. She gave water to the child. First time it's going to be okay, but next time she may not have money to buy a new bottle of bisleri. So the bisleri bottle will still very much be present, but in that tap water would be present. And when she gives it to the child, he'll obviously have loose motions. He will have diarrhea. He might even die. 
So the point is that we are not supposed to give anything to the child less than six months of age. And from the nutritional perspective, breast milk will be having sufficient amount of calories that is 65 kilocalories per 100 ml. But for the first six months of age, this is okay. But after six months of age, this caloric requirement will tremendously increase and the calories in the breast milk will be insufficient. So what are you going to advise? You're going to advise complementary feeds for the child. You see, earlier the term used was weaning. The meaning of the word weaning was that you stop breast milk and you start giving solid feeds. But now the concept is that you continue with breast feeding in a child up to two years of age. And along with that, cereals should also be given. And that is when the problems will start because all the standard cereals that we use in India or in America, they all will be having gluten component present in the cereal. The moment you introduce cereals in the child, that is when problems will occur. The child will start having loose motions. So earlier I was saying that if you are giving contaminated water to the child, they would be loose motions. But now after giving the standard cereals, the child is allergic to the gluten component present in the cereals. Either he will write the word gluten, he can write the word glidin or he can write it as slash as I have highlighted. Because of the allergy to this gluten component, the body of the child will produce some antibodies. And this is again an important part of this discussion because the antibody seen here is called as anti-TTG antibody that is anti-tissue transglutaminase antibody and once it is produced the bad news is it will damage the brush border villi it will decrease the absorptive surface area the end result is that the osmotic load would not be absorbed properly and therefore the child will start suffering from loose motions she will say categorically doctor since i followed your advice every time i give some solid feed to my child the moment i give some solid feed to the child my starts the uh, child starts having loose motions so she is indirectly blaming you though obviously you will tell her that uh, i um, no, i by looking at the face of your child i can't know that your child is allergic to something the bottom line is that the mcq of celiac proof will always begin with a child who is older than 6 months of age for cereals, you all know this mnemonic that is bro. So I can just write them for the sake of completion. That is barley. Then is gonna be rye. Then is gonna be oats and wheat. These are the four standard cereals which are gonna be used on a global basis. And intake of this is gonna contribute to problems in the child. Let's now look at how the case-based scenario will be given to you in the question. I today have an anxious mother. She's brought her child maybe for a routine vaccination. The child is older than six months of age. This child, she is saying that my baby is not gaining weight because you see every time the child comes for vaccination or for any consultation whatsoever, you always check the weight of the baby and you plot that on the growth chart which is present in the uh, healthy baby card. Now this mother, she's an educated one. She's following the growth of her child and she says, Doc, till six months everything was fine. But now I don't know. Since I have started giving cereals to the baby, he's not gaining weight. She thinks that cereals have some problem. She is saying the word the child is becoming malnourished. But as you are aware that before one year of age, we don't use the term protein energy malnutrition. We rather use in infants the term FTT that is failure to thrive. Either the question will use the term FTT or can use the term persistent diarrhea. And she has been to maybe one or two physicians or pediatricians and there has been not any substantial improvement in the condition of the child. She is also telling you that my child is looking pale. You see, a mother can definitely pick up that earlier her baby was relatively pink. But now she says, doctor, look at the palms of the child or the soles of the child. He looks so white. Well, for every mother, you know, her child is always a weak child. But here she is specifically emphasizing that the palms of the child are becoming pale. Why this is so is because this disease has a predilection to mainly affect the duodenum. So iron absorption is going to be hampered. As a result of it, since there is iron deficiency, pallor would occur in the child and iron deficiency anemia killed children, they always and mostly have delayed milestones. So most of the time it would be delayed motor milestones like normally you are aware from pediatrics child would start sitting with support, then standing with support, then standing without support and then walking. So all motor milestones definitely can be affected in patients with severe anemia. The type of anemia that will be encountered in this case will be due to iron deficiency. So I'm going to call it a microcytic hypochromic anemia. If this disease is afflicting also the jejunum, then folic acid deficiency can occur. This will contribute to macrocytic anemia. So do not be surprised if in a question he mentions dimorphic anemia for this child. 
the etiology I've explained, it would be combination of iron and folic acid deficiency. I've just put two arrows to highlight that duodenum in this disease is re relatively more severely affected than jejunum. And I'm not saying the fact that ileum is paired, it is ileum that is less commonly absorbed. So B12 deficiency is less likely or unlikely to be seen. I repeat the fact again, this disease mainly affects proximal part more than the distal part. So B12 deficiency may not occur to a substantially severe level to result in macrocytic anemia or development or neurological features because you are aware that vitamin B12 also plays a role in formation of myelin. And if there's a demyelination occurring of heavily myelinated tracts, then we also have neurological features. But in this disease, because usually ileum is mildly involved, or not grossly involved, I can therefore say that macrocytic anemia primarily due to B12 deficiency or any kind of neurological features would not be encountered in this child. Now, we have to do some tests by which we can identify this condition. This mother might be initially hostile to you. She might say, doctor, you are responsible. You see, I mean, Indian patients anyway have a habit of blaming everything on the doctor. But here, most of the time, you, you will have to be at least, I would say, patient with this mother because uh, she is pretty worried about the growth pattern of her child. The test you're going to write initially is called as anti-TTG antibody. And we can even measure the titer of the antibody as of now. That is tissue transglutaminous antibody. When I was a student at your age, I used to read some alternative terminologies also, which I would just like to share with you. It is not that these tests are not done. They can also be done as of now, like anti endomyocell antibody or anti glidin antibody. But when we compare the disease severity and the prevalence of the disease with the antibody titer per se, the first antibody that I've written, TTT antibody, should be the single best response in the MCQ. Coming to the investigation of choice for this condition, we will be doing a small intestinal mucosal biopsy. Well, this test will have to be done two times in the patient, one initially and then would be repeated after four to six week period. You see, when I'll do this small intestinal mucosal biopsy initially, when the report will come, it will always mention blunting of the villi. Now I will tell the mother that you are to stop giving cereals to the child. So we are basically doing a gluten elimination from the diet. It has to be 100% gluten elimination. Nothing related to the four products related to the name bro that I explained to you are to be given to the child. And after a duration of four weeks, a repeat biopsy will be done in this case. Now let's look at what will he talk about the repeat biopsy findings. We will be able to demonstrate regeneration of the villi I would like to highlight this fact that both things should be demonstrated in the person initially a flattening of the villi after a strict dietary elimination of gluten from the diet there should definitely be a regeneration of the villi so if both of these things are demonstrated that is when we say that this is a confirmed diagnosis of celiac group in fact I can just show you two images here also that would help you appreciate uh, the facts relatively better. You see, this may be the initial profile of the patient. If you look at this image, you definitely will notice the goblet cells and the villi look relatively flattened. And now compare this with the second image that I'll just bring on the monitor now. You will now notice that uh, in the second image, the villi have that characteristic finger-like appearance as you can see here the finger-like appearance is more pronounced in the image on the right so this is before and after image that i've highlighted before you so that and lots of time this has happened in the exam that they've given two histopath images and most guys said sir at least we could make up it make it out that it was gi and then the characteristic feature that you have to identify is the flattening of the villi i mean the standard finger-like projections is going to be missing so this is before and after report that I've highlighted before you and along with this anemia component failure to thrive present. I mean, there's going to be so many hints in the question that it is very, very unlikely that celiac sprue can be missed. And I'll put it even simpler. You see, whenever you talk about malabsorption syndrome in pediatric case, first differential diagnosis is always a celiac sprue. Coming to the treatment part of this condition, the mother is asking you, sir, you have asked me to stop cereals. What should I give to the child? So one of the cereal that can be given to this child is quinoa. Now quinoa is a little expensive one. You see most of the time when I, uh, I can just show you an image in fact again related to quinoa. Uh, you see one packet of it might be as much as 500 rupees. 
and uh, it's obviously horribly expensive i mean in india to expect a mother to purchase uh, quinoa for the child is a little far fetched i would say so yeah i mean if uh, economic issues are not there yes we can use quinoa for this condition but lots of time i mean the economic constraints will be very much present for this condition so let's look at what can we use alternatively in place of quinoa that would be maize i also want to tell you and what i say next please do not note down i repeat my statement please do not note down my next statement just listen to me here you see lots of time you might be telling the mother to give dosa idli to the child that is rice rice contains gluten but in minimal amounts rice contains gluten in minimal amount but in very poor families where they not gonna be able to purchase fancy stuff and you see maize may not be available round the clock in india or round the year around in india so every month it may not be available so the end result is that quinoa is preferred it's rich in proteins or along with that we can give a combination also to make it economical rice is just a point that i've tried to explain to you from the indian domain but otherwise in the exam please do not answer rice also i will give iron supplementation to this child i will be giving folic acid supplementation to the child these children do not require b12 supplementation since i said ileum is either spared or is minimally involved so that the manifestations are very limited now assuming the fact that the mother has understood everything that you have said and she is strictly following this gluten elimination from the diet or i can just write the word strict diet restriction is being followed so she in the follow up visits will definitely tell you that my child is gaining weight or the anemia competence has become lesser and she will be you know much more relaxed in a subsequent visits as compared to the initial ones and you need to tell her to continue with the follow ups it is important to continue with follow ups and you will also tell her that if you will do this very strictly the severity of the disease manifestations will gradually reduce usually by 10 years of age or approximately by 10 years of age the disease severity might become so less that once the child is older you see children when they are 13 14 years of age once they start you know going out the child might say that i want to go out and have a pizza or i want to go to somebody's birthday party and i want to eat some snacks etc you see initially this child was on dietly strict restrictions so we were not allowing any outside food restaurant food it was pure home cooked food for the child either it was quinoa or it was maize for the child but after 10 years of age if the severity of the disease is becoming lesser once in a while if a child wants to go to a birthday party and have something which is obviously not belonging to maize and quinoa yeah the child can have it so the good news is that if you are going to act initially in a aggressive fashion strictly fashion and go for strict diet restriction the disease severity will substantially reduce but now why i was emphasizing on the uh, follow up component was because this child can develop some complications also one of the very important complications that is asked in multiple choice questions and has been taught both in dermatology and at this moment i am taught teaching also is dermatitis herpetiformis so you will have encountered these questions talking about extra intestinal manifestation of these patients the leading one is dermatitis herpetiformis most of the time the child will be developing pruritic vesicles on the elbows and on the knees i'll show you the image also but i just want you to remember that just like you are comfortable with the fact that gotran papules are always found on the knuckles gotran papules were discussed in dermatomyositis gotran papules are always found on the knuckles i want you to remember if they all any time give you an image of vesicles which are present on the elbow and the highly pruritic child keeps on scratching so there would be excoriation also please appreciate in scabies the scratching would occur in all over the body right especially over the axilla over the groin area between the finger clefts of the person but in this case i'm mainly talking about vesicles which are going to be itchy on the elbows and on the knees of the patient once the image comes in you will be able to relate to this better but uh, first theory is obviously important so they can sometimes give you a spot diagnosis also if they give a history of celiac spru obviously it's a piece of cake for you then you don't need to refer to the image also but if they do not give the image or uh, cut but if they give the image alone without mentioning dermatitis herpetiformis even then you should be able to correct the question In fact we will also be going in for diagnosis of dermatitis herpetiformis in two ways one i can go for antibody that will help in diagnosis second is obviously a biopsy of the skin with immunofluorescence study when it comes to the antibody the name of this antibody is anti etg antibody that is anti epidermal transglutaminous antibody 
You see, it might look very easy for you at the moment, but I've seen people mess up between these antibody names in the final pressure in the exam. There are two names that I've told you today. One is double TG, that is tissue transglutaminous antibody. And currently the name that I'm telling you is ETG, that is epidermal transglutaminous antibody. Along with this, the biopsy report will also come. So most of the time you will be biopsy reports with immunofluorescence will always be green. And you will be able to see a breach in the basement membrane and then there would be lots of immune complex depositions. These immune complex depositions are mainly of immunoglobulin A and the complement. So like in the earlier parts of our discussion, we have talked about fishnet appearance with respect to uh, pemphigus vulgaris. I am today highlighting the fact that if you get a green line which is broken at multiple places with these dots which are greenish in color, again representing immunoglobulin A and C3 deposits, your diagnosis would be what we are discussing right now. I want to emphasize if he begins by celiac sprue, this will not be any trouble for you. So I want you to have a capacity where even if celiac sprue is not given in the question, the history of malabsorption is not given in the question, spot on, you should be able to identify that the patient's lesion is dermatitis herpetiformis and this is how it will look. The question will mention vesicles on the elbows. You can see the vesicles which are proritic. So you can notice lots of erythema present which are present on the knee joint of the patient. And then is this green line I was talking about. And this shows that spot spotty appearance. That spots are basically the IgA and the C3 deposits. Additional aspects which are to be remembered for this topic would be, and that's bad news for the parents that you would tell that I think that your child may, obviously I'm not saying always, may develop type 1 diabetes. Here I can put up a question to you guys just to keep your interest going. Can you tell me the cutoff for diagnosis of diabetes mellitus in children? Adults, we know HP1C more than 6.5%. Suppose it's a 10, 12 year old child. You're suspecting he might be having type 1 diabetes because it's associated with celiac sprue. What is the cutoff HP1C? The answer is still 6.5%. Similarly, the fasting values of 126 to our values of 200. The cutoffs useful for diagnosis of pediatric diabetes and adult diabetes are same. The next statement is even the way more important. In fact, this is the last paragraph of celiac sprue topic in Harrison and that is from where he has created the question. You see, these kids can also be having chances of development of GI cancer and the GI cancer that develops is not adenocarcinoma, it is lymphoma of the gut. In fact, why is it so important? The point number three that I've written is, if he says, what is the most common cause of death in celiac sprue, then do not answer malabsorption, malnutrition, electrolyte imbalance, because diarrhea is occurring, so electrolyte imbalance. Do not answer any of the earlier statements that I said. The number one cause of death in celiac sprue is going to be answered by you as malignancy. Most guys have a habit of answering things like malabsorption and uh, associations of diarrhea like electrolyte imbalance. But the answer to this uh, question is uh, what I've just highlighted. And this is actually the last paragraph of this particular topic. So lots of time, you know, we, when we read a topic, we tend to focus more in the initial part. It's just that you need to maintain consistency when you're reading a topic, when you're listening to a lecture, right from the beginning to the end, your concentration has to be spot on. And I've highlighted this time and again, that if you are going to listen to this repeatedly, then the chances of your ability to retain this information will be relatively higher. The next topic I'm going to explain to you is tropical sprue which will be explaining regarding adult patient. The number one reason why this can happen is primarily because of coliforms and in the coliforms so the predominant one is E. coli. In some books he will also mention regarding GRDR but if both are given in questions and they ask for a single best response your answer happens to be E. coli. Now what is this coliforms gonna do? You see I'm not talking about E. coli based idea just once. It is repeatedly occurring so this might be a relatively low socioeconomic strata person or for that matter of fact a person from western country who's come to India and is a low budget traveler. Now this guy is going to stay in cheap hotels, he might be eating street food in India and Americans once they eat street food in India, they really going to get sick and they might be having multiple episodes of E. coli diarrhea. So the end result is that if you have a recurrent E. coli infection of the gut, especially due to street food consumption, then this person will be having mucosal gut injury and the bad news is then uh, the osmotic diarrhea component can definitely set in. Apart from this, it has been documented that uh, this condition can contribute to impairment of gut motility also. Now, when I say the fact that gut motility is lesser, most doctors, they send me a message saying that, sir, if you're saying gut motility is lesser, will it not cause constipation? 
you see i'm not saying that gut motility is going to be reduced to the level that it's going to cause a constipation all i'm saying is that the peristaltic waves are not occurring in the gut the way they should so what is the problem if gut motility is slightly reduced the osmotic load you see whatever solid food that you've eaten carbohydrate basically contains sugar so whatever that you have eaten that will remain in the gut for longer duration no? i want to emphasize the fact that if gut motility is significantly hampered obviously then constipation will occur here there's a slight reduction in the gut motility the end result is that the osmotic contents remain in the intestine for relatively longer duration and therefore therefore because they're remaining in the gut for longer duration they can draw more water and once they draw more water the stool will be softer that's what i meant by the word osmotic diarrhea occurring in the patient i want to highlight this statement because usually i get a lot of queries saying that sir you said decreased gut motility why is it not going to be constipation it's a slight reduction so the end result is again an osmotic diarrhea component coming up let us now talk about the clinical features that will be occurring in this patient. He will begin by describing an adult or he might be a traveler from a foreign country who is having these problems at the moment. The primary complaints is osmotic diarrhea. Now because this makes diagnosis relatively easier and you are able to understand it's something related to malabsorption. So you have to select from those options. So he might be just using some terminologies just to uh, I would say waste your time like uh, bloating or borboigemi or abdominal fullness or just abdominal discomfort occurring in this person there would be a weight loss occurring because you see carbohydrates constitute a important source of nutrition if carbohydrates are not absorbed so the calorie component absorbed from the gut on a daily basis reduces that's why i said weight loss occurring in this guy also occurring will be stetoria this will cause bulky greasy foul smelling stools and concomitant with that would be deficiency of vitamin A, D, E and K. Now I want to highlight that uh, when it comes to vitamin K deficiency there might be features like uh, purpuras. Meaning of the word purpura would be palpable bleed in the skin. Vitamin D deficiency will contribute to bone pain. Vitamin A deficiency can contribute to night blindness or nyctalopia. I am leaving one for you guys. Can you tell me manifestations of vitamin E deficiency? One of the manifestations of vitamin E deficiency is neurological feature that can come up. And that would be answered by you as ataxia. Another feature of vitamin E deficiency is RBC surface or RBC membrane will be appearing to have spikes. So the RBCs that are seen with vitamin E deficiency are called as acanthocytes. So there is a distinct possibility that because in this condition the levels of these fat soluble vitamins will be lesser. Therefore either in the general physical examination or maybe in the workup of this patient he might talk about terms like acanthocytes in a workup or purpura general physical examination. Because B complex group of vitamins can also be affected. You see after all it's a mucosal disease no so even water soluble vitamins the levels can definitely reduce. This will give him opportunity to describe terms like uh, stomatitis or chiliosis or gingivitis. So uh, most of the time I will find that uh, doctors do not have difficulty in identifying this disease per se because the manifestations are relatively very characteristic. Muscle weakness will also occur in these patients subsequently. The reason why uh, myalgia or muscle weakness is described is due to electrolyte imbalance because he is having these loose motions on a recurrent basis every time he eats food he needs to go to the washroom. Uh, I have discussed irritable bubble syndrome separately so I hope you are understanding that in irritable bubble syndrome person might be having bloating. There might be abdominal distension but when he will go to the washroom he might be having passage of stool after that there will be relief of symptoms of the patient. But in this case the manifestations will persist. These patients will be having recurrent episodes of loose motions and in fact even if we study about irritable bubble syndrome where diarrhea is mainly a symptom the total amount of stool passed is usually less than 200 ml. I have discussed that in IBS guys but I am highlighting that in irritable bubble syndrome person will go to washroom again and again even if he is saying diarrhea no the volume of stool is not much but in this case the volume of stool can definitely be substantial so there can be electrolyte imbalance that can come in so high so there can be electrolyte component that can come in that would be hypokalemia apart from this he can also talk about proteins not being absorbed in this person so because of hypoalbuminemia occurring in these patients uh, they could be development of puffy eyes or periorbital edema. 
Now I need to do a workup of this patient. The best way to confirm the diagnosis would be a small intestinal mucosal biopsy. This will again be showing a blunting of the villi. I don't need to repeat it once again, unlike in celiac sprue where we had to repeat it at least twice. I would just like to summarize what I have highlighted at the moment for this particular topic before we talk about the treatment part. He says that you need to demonstrate at least two product malabsorption. Like what I mean by two product malabsorption is like carbohydrate malabsorption and then uh, fat malabsorption. At least two products malabsorption has to be demonstrated in a person. Like uh, if I am not having access to a biopsy or person is refusing, I can do a breath hydrogen test and a breath triolene test. No? Breath hydrogen test is for uh, uh, carbohydrate malabsorption, breath triolene test is for uh, fat malabsorption. So two product malabsorption must be demonstrated with ideally biopsy findings. That way you are sure about the fact that you are dealing with a tropical sprue in a person. If it's a foreign patient like American patient or let me say English person coming over to India. So uh, he's gone back to America and now he's having these diarrhea manifestations. So if if, if, in this, uh, if in his case file it is mentioned that there is a history of travel to a third world that is countries like India, Sri Lanka, etc. So history of travel to developing countries and then development of diarrhea subsequently after eating a street food is uh, again a very good hint towards diagnosis of tropical sprue. Let us now look at what is the treatment for this condition. So your primary antibiotic that you're going to write for this guy is tetracycline. Along with this, because jejunum is mainly affected, therefore folic acid supplementation would be done in this case. Unlike in celiac sprue where I was giving iron plus folic acid, here we are primarily giving folic acid because it has been demonstrated that it is jejunum that is worst affected in this condition. The next topic that I'm going to explain to you is called as Whipple's disease. This would be caused by an intracellular bacteria with a slightly tongue twisting name that is Tropherma vipoli. Uh, you see I have explained to you regarding extracellular bacteria that is Helicobacter pylori but this is going to be intracellular and it's going to be found in the macrophages of the gut. So we need to use more aggressive treatment for this because it's a relatively more a invasive organism. Let's look at the manifestations that are caused here. The question will again describe an adult person with muscle wasting. He will talk about weight loss in an individual. So the manifestations are same as that of tropical sprue. I can just bring that slide to your notice once again. I mean, what is the information that would be given? It would be standard information related to carbohydrate malabsorption and fat malabsorption. Now, there are some additional pointers also that I want to highlight, but this is going to be the initial profile of the question. You see, because there's also weight loss occurring in a person, there's a protein deficiency occurring in a person. So there's a distinct possibility that he might even in some questions in general physical examination, especially he would write a feature of protein deficiency. You see, whenever there's going to be a significant protein deficiency, like even in quashier or in pediatrics, when there's a substantial protein deficiency, you will read about presence of cellophane skin cellophane paper right it's very thin parchment like paper the skin has become very thin parchment like so cellophane skin again highlights protein deficiency in the body which would be secondary to the muscle wasting component that would come up in all of these diseases because the nutritional supply is definitely hampered now what are some special pointers that will be given in the question which will tell you that this is whipper's disease would be some cns and cardiovascular manifestations if you read about features of malabsorption plus development of dementia, you see very shocking, no young age person with malabsorption syndrome with dementia manifestations. He might even mention some neurological features like nystagmus, even might mention seizures in a patient. So the surprising thing is that a combination of malabsorption syndrome with CNS manifestations or even cardiovascular manifestation might be occurring in this person in the form of aortic valve disease. These two pointers will always ensure that the question is going to be the topic that we are discussing. For diagnosis, I will be doing a small intestinal mucosal biopsy. And then we will use a special stain called as PAS or is called as Schiff's reagent. Small intestinal mucosal biopsy has a high diagnostic yield in this case. Most of the time, the multiple choice question will himself describe all these findings that is of a PAS positive intracellular bacteria. And why am I highlighting the statement is guys because I need in IV antibiotics because you see the infection is so deep seated in the gut. 
it is in the security system these these bacteria are sitting in the macrophages so device to method of bypassing the security system that i would say it's it's relatively a deep seated infection occurring in the gut pos positive intracellular bacteria now a related terminology i can mention here for alpha 1 antitrypsin deficiency because there also you read about pos positive inclusions in the hepatocytes i want to tell that in alpha 1 antitrypsin deficiency you have defective alpha 1 antitrypsin which is in defective in a sense that it is not that it is not produced it is produced but it is not excreted so it keeps on accumulating in the hepatocytes and hepatocytes are damaged so whenever you read the term pos positive inclusions in hepatocytes that is when you need to think in terms of alpha 1 antitrypsin deficiency which is also associated with panacea emphysema but in this case i use the term pos positive intracellular bacteria which are going to be located in the macrophages of the gut now i can just zoom in the image which is uh, showing so many inclusions these are obviously a very high power view which you can see uh, in the gut where these inclusions are found inside inside the security system now we will have to use a more aggression for management of this case so initial antibiotic that is given is ceftriaxone normally we read about ceftriaxone for bacterial meningitis no because third generation spellosporins is when we are talking about infection of the meninges but a gut infection where we are giving ceftriaxone apart from typhoid right drug of choice for typhoid nowadays is ceftriaxone and uh, i mean it can vary from country to country in india mostly ceftriaxon is used the second time in gi when you start with ceftriaxon to be given is whipple's disease and here unlike in typhoid you will give treatment for 7 days maybe 10 days max max 14 days but here you will again have to give at least ceftriaxon for 2 weeks and that's not the end of the story because the infection is deep seated in this case you will also have to give oral cotrimoxazole so there are two antibiotics that are used in this case first ceftriaxone then cotrimoxazole and the duration of cotrimoxazole is a huge 6 months i want you to remember the details which are highlighted here especially the cns in the cvs manifestations will be given in the question and they are obviously a uh, time wasting tactic by the examiner because if you can just pick up it's a malabs option syndrome in adults either it's going to be tropical sprue or it's going to be whipple's disease so if you can pick up the clinical pointers in the question you definitely have cracked the question i mean even if you don't know how to evaluate the histopathology image like lots of guys will say sir i did, i cannot even pick up that this is gi i mean it's a high power view so if i'm not a pathologist i cannot pick up that okay these are inclusions inside the security system does not matter what matters is you just need to pick up malabsorption syndrome in adult two differentials either it is tropical sprue it is whipple's disease if is going to incorporate cns or cvs manifestations you know the diagnosis of the patient in fact we can also do a pcr no i mean one more technique that i can use for identification of this condition is also pcr but then the cost factor can definitely come in in that case also some related terminologies that i would like to highlight is one is whipple's triad i have discussed this in the topic of insulinoma with pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors second is whipple's operation you know that from surgery that would be related to cancer of the head of the pancreas so there are three terms that begin with the word whipple whipple's disease whipple's triad and then whipple's operation that i have just highlighted before you and next i'll explain to you bacterial overgrowth syndrome this topic is relatively less studied because it's towards the end of the discussion but we need to keep the focus on and right at the onset of describing the topic i want to tell you that the investigation of choice for this condition is not small intestinal mucosal biopsy while i speak i'll give you some time to think what could be the investigation of choice for this condition but it is not a small intestinal mucosal biopsy as is the answer for most of the cases of malabsorption syndrome let us try to understand what is the problem in this case you see i'm just trying to represent here the cecum i have shown the appendix then i have shown the ileum you see uh, at the junction of the ileum and the cecum would be the iliocolic sphincter this iliocolic sphincter works as a one way valve it will always allow food from the small intestine that is the ileum to go into the cecum but it will not allow any contents of the cecum to come back into the small intestine so the the functional uh, aspects of the sphincter are highly important because it will prevent the anaerobes you see the count of anaerobes when we look at the count of anaerobes in the large intestine they are to the tune of 10 raised to power 11 
when it comes to the bacteria in the ileum they are something in the range of 10 is to 8 and as you start going towards the jejunum the counts will progressively reduce i mean there are hardly any bacteria in the duodenum and in the proximal part of the jejunum but then as we start going distally the counts will start rising you need to remember two values at the moment the bacterial count in the cecum and ascending colon and it will keep on increasing subsequently is 10 to power 11 and there are relatively lesser number of bacteria present in uh, the terminal part of the ileum now, if God forbid the iliopolic sphincter malfunctions, I'm just saying malfunction by just a hashtag here. If the iliopolic sphincter will malfunction, then the, the functionality of this is hampered. So this can allow the bacteria of the large intestine to come into the small intestine. And once the counts will increase, the local mucosal damage can be seen. When you read the term bacterial overgrowth syndrome, I want you to appreciate the fact that it's not that the bacteria start growing just by that or just like that. It is rather a damage to the integrity of the iliopolic sphincter. Now, why can that happen? It could be due to TB. It could be due to Crohn's disease because Crohn's disease involves the terminal ileum or rather common in India, typhoid can, if typhoid also involves the, the ileum and if typhoid involves, if the ulcer of typhoid involves the sphincter also, so the functionality of the sphincter would be hampered. So any of these causes which are relatively, you know, when I say typhoid per se in poor socioeconomic status in India would be commoner. So all of these conditions can damage iliopolic sphincter and in some cases the damage may not be demonstrated also. It is just that this sphincter does not work properly. So it could even be idiopathic occurring in a person. The bottom line is that you are going to be having large gut flora, mark my words there, large intestinal bacteria are migrating into the small intestine and are causing mucosal damage. The end result would be a B12 malabsorption. One of the highlights of this condition is apart from mucosal disease of the of the terminal ileum which will contribute to nutrients being malabsorbed, B12 deficiency will definitely be a feature of this condition because that's the primary site of absorption of B12. Now let us look at what will happen to folic acid levels in this condition and surprisingly when I was a student your age in the books it used to be written folic acid levels are elevated in bacterial overgrowth syndrome and there was no explanation given in standard books so we used to be very surprised and discuss with my friends you know I used to talk about here yeah, why is folic acid elevated here it should also be reduced and that's the same query that I get even today after so many years from young doctors in final year who are asking me sir why is folic acid elevated after all you were saying no mucosal disease. If mucosal disease is in the ileum, mucosal disease should be present even in the jejunum because bacteria are going retrograde. So there should be a decrease of folic acid level, but it is elevated, no? So I want to tell you that why is this folic acid level elevated is because you see folic acid in this condition is being produced in excess by bacteria. The point is because the bacterial count is increased in the proximal part of the gut that is the small bubble so bacterial metabolism that is what is description given in uh, the gastroenterology books they say the bacterial metabolism produces folate compounds and these folate compounds tend to increase the folic acid level so this is a very good pointer towards the diagnosis of this condition because traditional thought process would be that if jejunum is damaged or ileum is damaged then jejunum should also be involved because the infection is going retrogradely so logically speaking if i just go by logic then b12 and folic acid both should be lesser but that is not the case here no? folic acid is elevated because that's the end product of bacterial metabolism that is generated in very large amounts in this case because of which the folic acid levels would be highly elevated and apart from this standard features of malabsorption syndrome in the form of osmotic diarrhea can be given because mucosal disease is anywhere since mucosal disease is present he will write the words like uh, uh, he can say breath hydrogen test is uh, defective or he can rather say desilose absorption test is defective in this case. So I want to highlight if you read a question in which uh, desilose absorption test is also defective and simultaneously B12 levels that is Schilling's test or any other test for B12 deficiency both are demonstrated together. You need to demonstrate or you need to be uh, first thinking in terms of bacterial overgrowth syndrome also called as SIBO that is small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. To confirm the diagnosis of this condition, the best way would be to go in for jejunal aspirate and culture. Now this is what examiners would like to hear from you because they know the thought process of any doctor would be that for any malabsorption the answer is small intestinal mucosal biopsy. But I think I have given you substantial uh, lag period to come to the diagnosis of this condition. Jejunal aspirate and culture is the best way by which you can demonstrate and now the culture will be showing more than 10 to power. 11 organisms per ml 
of the jejunal aspirate that has been uh, taken out traditionally this count should be present in the large bubble so the point is large bubble counts in the small bubble is what is called as bacterial overgrowth syndrome other tests that can be used for diagnosis can be breath hydrogen test i hope you recall that's because to test for carbohydrate malabsorption we can go in for breath triolein test he can either describe the symptoms the traditional ones that are spoken multiple times or he can write these tests also that can help you in identification as i said abnormal shillings test combination of abnormal shillings test with elevated folate levels and malabsorption syndrome manifestations given is a diagnosis or a shortcut that can be used for uh, identification of this condition the treatment will be metronidazole because i want to get rid of the anaerobes here i also want to bring in an anatomical aspect here uh, one student just sent me a image based question actually and uh, he said that he had this uh, exam in which there was a arrow at where the appendix you can see this i'm just putting a small a appendix is uh, meeting with the cecum so the question was anatomical obviously the he was said what is the name of this valve so what i've shown subsequently in red color is the ileocecal valve but uh, this valve at the junction of the cecum and the appendix is called as valve of gerlach this is just a accessory fact that i thought i'll just share with you because you see young doctors like you keep on sending me queries so as they keep on sending me queries i think that i should just share with everybody so that was just a small effort there uh, of an additional point being mentioned otherwise the primary focus for uh, uh, manifestations of this patient will begin by describing adult having abdominal distension and then he will talk about bloating after eating food borboy gamy developing in this person weight loss occurring and uh, sometimes not always he might even say the word bile acid diarrhea well you are aware of the fact that uh, when it comes to metabolism of bile acids then uh, bile acids are again assimilated in the terminal ileum and uh, if they are uh, the terminal ileum mucosa is hampered then the uh, bile acid metabolism part is also distorted so bile acid diarrhea is a feature can that can be seen with bacterial overgrowth syndrome i will now describe a question to you that begin by describing a person having a abnormal shillings test though i have already told you this test may not be routinely available at least in routine laboratories the question then said that the test is becoming normalized so there is a normalization with metronidazole now how did that happen was because metronidazole killed those excessive anaerobes and the normalcy was obtained and the end result was uh, normalization of shillings test the disease that we are talking about is what we just discussed few seconds ago that is bacterial overgrowth syndrome or small intestinal bacterial overgrowth let me write this again so that you can be more sensitized to this suppose you get a question in the exam that says person is having abnormal shillings test and then there is a normalization occurring but this is occurring with pancreatic enzyme supplementation this means the fact that this person was suffering from chronic pancreatitis because if there is a pancreatic enzyme deficiency even then b12 is not absorbed one of the reasons for b12 malabsorption is going to be intrinsic factor deficiency another can be pancreatic enzyme deficiency and thirdly can be bacterial overgrowth syndrome if pancreatic enzyme supplementation is causing normalization of this shillings test therefore the diagnosis of the person would be given as chronic pancreatitis which can obviously be confirmed by doing a ct abdomen in this person if you get a question that says abnormal shillings test is present in a person and there is a normalization occurring but this normalization is occurring with rather intrinsic factor supplementation then you know that the diagnosis is type a gastritis i have just tried to highlight here three standard questions which have been asked in the exam the concept is that he mentioned abnormal and a normal shillings test in between the two there was some intervention done the intervention was one in the form of administration of metronidazole second time a pancreatic enzyme third time a intrinsic factor and therefore he said what is the probable diagnosis of the patient so if you just highlight on the three terminologies on the extreme right hand side you can understand why there's a normalization because you're treating the problem of the person i mean you are killing up the anaerobes you're giving a pancreatic enzyme supplementation that is why there's a normalization occurring in this case so i'll now quickly summarize regarding the investigations that you have been taught for the following disorders for celiac through the main test to be done is a small intestinal mucosal biopsy 
well it has to be repeated two times before and after and you can demonstrate the flattening versus the regeneration component and uh, therefore you are spot on in your diagnosis and if he gives you regarding anti ttg or anti gladin antibody or anti endometriosis that's anyway a welcome bonus for whipper's disease i have highlighted uh, again a small intestinal mucosal biopsy with the mention of pass positive inclusions which are those nasty bacteria sitting inside the security system that is macrophages for small intestinal bacterial overgrowth syndrome however the investigation that is recommended would be a jejunal aspirate and a culture the culture report will be showing high counts in the small bubble that would be to the tune of 10 raised to power 11 organisms per ml i mean traditionally the counts here are in the range of 10 raised to power 8 I did not write tropical sprue here because you see for tropical sprue even if you do not do a small intestinal mucosal biopsy tab bhi chalega that's because you need to demonstrate two products malabsorption either with the help of breath hydrogen breath tyrolin test with history of traveling to a developing country or for indian patient like a person eating out street food and having recurrent episodes of diarrhea if you demonstrate what i just said two products malabsorption it's a diagnosis so small intestinal mucosal biopsy uh, is not mandatory to be done in cases of tropical sprue I also want to highlight that I have explained to you regarding these ILOS test which is going to be telling you regarding problems of the mucosa of the gut being hampered and for Schilling's test obviously it is B12 deficiency because ileum is hampered now I want to talk about combinations here the combination I mean is like suppose you get a question which says D xylos test is absorption is defective that means that there is going to be mucosal disease and he says Schilling's test is also abnormal so if you are having two abnormal simultaneously you see if you look at the second entry in this table bacterial overgrowth syndrome it is both a mucosal disease as well as uh the shilling test will also be abnormal it will become normal after antibiotics that is a separate issue what i'm saying is if you get a question in which both reports are given to be abnormal you have to think in terms of bacterial overgrowth syndrome on the other hand suppose let's take up case of celiac sprue celiac sprue is only a mucosal disease na in that right in the beginning i said ileum is usually not involved or is minimally involved that we don't get a b12 deficiency that is why if you see the report here it is written celiac sprue d xylose is absorption is decreased but schilling's test is normal because i highlight once again that ileum is usually not affected the message is that there will be only one mcq where you will have to answer a particular term where both d xylos absorption test will be normal schilling's test will be normal and still there is a malabsorption well the condition that i'm teaching you towards the end so keep the focus on is called as intestinal lymphangiectasia well as you can read from the word lymphangiectasia it means malformation of the lymphatic channels in the gut you are aware of the fact that fat is going to be absorbed from the gut in the form of chylomicrons and then it is transmitted via the lymphatic system before it travels into the into the thoracic duct and then goes into uh, the venous circulation the message is in lymphangiectasia there is abnormal development or there is rather no communication they these are abnormal lymphatic channels which are not communicating with ultimately the main thoracic duct as a result of it fat will not be absorbed and therefore the question will begin by describing features of steatorrhea in this person so the hints that i want you to remember is if a question begins by describing mainly steatorrhea manifestations says the fact that schilling's test is normal he also says d xylos test is also normal you will be in a fix because traditionally our thought process is because we in studying this topic malabsorption we anticipate that these two tests either of these two should be abnormal but if a question describes both of them to be normal you need to think in terms of this particular disorder intestinal lymphangiectasia well how this disease will be diagnosed obviously a biopsy because a biopsy will be demonstrating dilated lymphatics so you saw here that tropical sprue even if you don't do a biopsy chalega but you need to do a biopsy for intestinal lymphangiectasia because otherwise how do you demonstrate the malformation the final summary here is for malabsorption usually the test like d xylos shilix are abnormal the only only mcq of malabsorption where both of these tests are given to be normal and still there is steatorrhea manifestations is intestinal lymphangiectasia these are the details that i want you to remember for this topic keep learning guys keep hammering on a regular basis keep on learning these micro topics sub topics on a regular basis you keep on upgrading yourself that is the strength that you will develop over a period of time thank you so much for hearing me out